Welcome to this snowy winter morning. Well, fall morning, I guess. Um, we're gonna. We just want to welcome you to worship with us today. And um, everybody, stand. And we're gonna do something a little different this morning. Um, yep. We have someone in our presence that's having a very special birthday today. And we're going to sing happy birthday to Norma this morning. So, happy birthday to you. Happy birthday.
join me with me if you wish. 16th chapter of the Psalms. And find it if you would stand, please.
every day I'll get better. So I'd rather make it normal. I have a phrase, and I thank you. Uh, for my birthday party yesterday, I just want to thank everybody that came and brought cards. I got a total of 92 cards. Wow. I just wasn't fond of my outfit, but uh, we, had a, we had a wonderful time. Well, I'll tell you, Norma, I love you to death, but I was disappointed you wouldn't get up out of that chair and dance with me. <laughs> Men's breakfast yesterday was a time of praise. We had a really good turnout. We invited our wives, and I forget, I think I counted up once, but I can't remember what it was, but I want to say 14. 14? Good, good turnout. Any other?
Let us be reminded this morning that our, our prayer for the world, the prayer for ourselves, is, is that um, God might keep us safe. That it might be a place that we can take our refuge, that we can find our strength, and we can find our courage in the midst of not only the troubles, but also the uh, celebrations of our life. We give him credit for being in our presence in all of those moments. So let us give ourselves to him this morning. Let's pray. Gracious and merciful Father, we lay our lives before you this morning in anticipation of our celebration of Thanksgiving. Lord, we know in our hearts that we give Thanksgiving for the big and the small things, the things that seem trivial, but also the things that seem important, all because your hand has reached itself in our lives. We also recognize that others will gather this holiday season, um, and they don't know. They don't make the same confession. But Lord, on their behalf, we pray that this might be a season where they find you as their refuge. They find you as their source of thanksgiving, their source of strength, and their uh, source of courage, especially in the midst of times that are troubled, broken, struggling. Lord, it is our prayer this morning that you would work through us to be your hands and feet, to be your mouthpieces in times of grieving, in times of loss, but also in the times of encouragement and thanksgiving. Wherever we are and whoever we have gathered with, whoever is in our community, may they know that your light is shining and that your lamp is guiding us. Lord, you've heard the voices of your servants this morning weighed down. Some with thanks that you've healed, one that they love, but yet there's even more of a regular recovery for those loved ones. And so we pray that you would be that continuous source of healing in their midst. We thank you for successful surgeries. We pray for the healing that comes afterwards. We pray that the pain and the struggle would not be overbearing. Lord, we pray for those that um, are struggling right now with their health from COVID, from viruses, from infections that they just can't seem to get. Lord, we pray that you would be in the midst of those times and in the midst of their struggles, that you would be uh, uh, a source of peace and a source of comfort for them <clears throat> as they allow their bodies to heal. Lord, give their bodies time to heal. But Lord, we also gather today thankful for another day of living, thankful for another life that we can see, a year of life that we can celebrate. Lord, we know that those times come because of your hand. We know that they come because we have taken refuge in you. We have found you as our source of, of our foundation, as well as our source of comfort in times. Lord, I pray that you would continue to guide us today. That you would help us to celebrate through the breaking of a meal together. And that like the road to Emmaus, that our meal would not just be something that we partake of, but that you are revealed in the midst of those times, in the midst of the conversations that are taking place, in the midst of our pouring our lives out in the presence of one another. For Lord, we give you all the thanks. We give you all the praise. For it is your hand that makes all things possible. It is your hand that is making all things good. Shine on us today, Lord. Show us your path. Make it clear. Remove the stumbling blocks from before us. Yet, Lord, when we do stumble, when we do falter, when we do sin, 
We pray that you would take those in your hands and your forgiveness and your mercy would pour itself upon us. Lord, most of all, this morning, I pray that you might make us alive. Alive because of Christ. Alive in Christ. As we seek to be your people and we ask that you would be our God. Lord, we ask all these things in your precious and holy and significant name this morning. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 May it be so. Let us stand once again and sing the words of the doctrine, giving praise to so much.
So this morning, um, I got up to practice the song that I was going to sing today and had it all ready, laid the CD on the table, and thought that I had put it in my bag to come to church. And when I got to church, there was no CD in there. It, there was a CD in there, but it was an old one, and it wasn't the one I had planned to sing today. So it was time to change gears and uh, regroup and find something to sing then. So, so I uh, got the hymn book out and, and uh, went to the Thanksgiving section. Since this is our time of Thanksgiving today, our Thanksgiving meal in this time of year. And, uh, you know, we, we don't thank God enough for everything that we have. We have so many blessings. And um, we just, if we had to count them all, we just couldn't. We'd be counting them for the rest of our lives because there's so many blessings that we have. And uh, so, but this time of year is especially a time when we, we think about that and we are a little more, maybe a little more, giving a little more praise to God. And, and so, uh, this is a, a song of thanksgiving, um, and it's a Gaither song, and, and it's one that I really like. So um, we're going to get through this one today for this, so, and I'll do the other one some other time. Just a moment that um, 
You know, if we just think about those words, we are so blessed. Um, the author of Hebrews is unfolding um, his logic, he's laying the groundwork for the fact of uh, speaking to a congregation of Jewish Christians to remind them that what God had done in Jesus um, eliminated the need for the old covenant. It doesn't eliminate the fact that God spoke in those ways. It doesn't eliminate the fact that we have to struggle still as people of the New Testament, the people of Jesus, looking back into the Old Testament, that we kind of have to look sometimes and wrestle with the fact that, well, you know, all these laws, do we need to keep up or do I have we been free from them? What, what's our relationship to them? No, but it does mean that what the law was incapable of doing, Jesus fulfilled. And we'll hear in the passage this morning what that was. And with the freedom that it gives us to live in this world and live as his people. The author of Hebrews in chapter 10 reminds us that day after day, every priest stands and performs their religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifice, moment after moment, which can never take away sin. But when this priest had offered for the all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. And since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool, because by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made whole. Now the Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this. By saying, this is the covenant I will make with them. After that time, says the Lord, I will put my laws in their hearts. And I will write them on their minds. And then he adds, their sins and lawless acts, I will remember no more. And where these have been forgiven, there is no longer any sacrifice for sin. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain that is Jesus' body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us now draw near to God with a sincere heart, in full assurance of our faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us also hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider now how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, and let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another and all the more as we see the day of Christ here. <coughs> May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his words from the book of Hebrews this morning. I remember as a child, um, it, what, let, me, let me say this first. Anybody in the room under 40, I'm about ready to go all old school on this illustration. So bear with me, you know, in the day of, of, of earbuds and iPhones and the, you know, the days are gone since we've had Walkmans that we could put on our ears. You know, when I was a young kid, I remember having a portable record player with built-in speakers, with a place to put my small LPs right there in the case, and it buttoned up, it snapped down, a place for extra needles in it, and you could carry that thing around. I didn't know that. I remember that thing very fun. That you could carry it from room to room, and wherever you wanted to go, you could listen to music. I remember putting on one of my favorite records one day and realizing that it had a crack in it. Most likely, we stepped on it. 
didn't put it away properly, and it had a small little crack. And anybody that has ever played vinyl knows what happens when you get a crack in vinyl. You sit there on the same track, and when that crack comes up, it just goes, it just jumps. But you're just sitting there listening, moment after moment, to the same thing. Well, I love this, this, this record. I love listening to it. And I'd still put it on, hoping one day that maybe it would get past that small little crack. <clears throat> and sure enough, unbeknownst to me one day as I was sitting there playing it, it happened to jump enough that it got on the track and finished the record. Isn't that so true of our lives? That sometimes we're just kind of on the same track. And it's broken. But and we, we're sitting there in our lives and we hear it go, Kizzle, Kizzle. That we hear that needle jumping. All that just start the same track over and over <coughs> and over again. Well, I was reminded of that when I read this passage. That, that, that the author of Hebrews is talking and trying to encourage the people that it's not that the Old Covenant is invalid. It isn't as if God wasn't speaking to you. But because of what Jesus has done, that crack in your life, that crack in your own record, that crack in your story, that just keeps repeating itself. Jesus has come and he has redeemed us through the sacrifice that he wants. And back then, the priests, day in, day out, moment after moment, they were constantly going to the temple, and they were offering sacrifices for their sins. And the author of Hebrews reminds us that what that day in, day out process, that continuous process does, the only power it ever had was to remind us that we are horribly broken and sinful in need of God. And his mercy and his grace. But that very repetitiveness, that very um, mundane kind of circular motion that happens day after day, moment after moment, it's no longer necessary because Jesus provided a single sacrifice. And while we're reminded of our sins, the power of the gospel, the power of the good news, the power of our thanksgiving is this. That through that, the power of sin over us has been removed. What the old covenant was powerless to do, and that is remove sin from our presence and its power and its hold over us, has now been accomplished through Jesus. And these Hebrew Christians, these Jewish Christians, these people struggling with the questions that we don't have to. These questions of, do we keep the Old Covenant? What is its importance? What, what, what do things look like now that Jesus has come? The author of Hebrews says, well, it's, it's a way that God spoke to you. It's a way that God reminds you of your sin. Go on with the ritual, but remember that Jesus is the one that has freed you. He's freed you from the bonds of the old government. He's freed you from having to bring sacrifices day in and day out because he, is, he has removed sin and its power from among you. That's what forgiveness is. It's God looking at us and saying, I see your sin, but I remember it no more. I will overlook it. I will look beyond it because I want to see you as my good creation. And that's why I sent my son to walk in this world with you, to enter into suffering willingly, and to die so that you might be free. For that we should give thanks. For that, we should recognize that we are so blessed by the gift from his hand, whose name is Jesus. And what has it done for us? But the author of Hebrew reminds us that it has given us confidence to be in the presence, to be in the most holy of places. And that's important for us to remember because in the old covenant, 
Remember when Moses was called up the mountainside? And he had to instruct the people. And at one moment in the Old Testament, he instructed them, tell no one to come near the foothills of the mountain. Because if they do, they will die. If they touch the holiest places, they will expire. They will die. Well, we no longer have to be worried about that because of what Jesus has done. The book of Hebrews chapter 10 tells us that in his body, he tore that veil that separated the people and the priests from the Holy of Holies, from God's presence itself. Jesus' body ripped that veil in half. It tore it apart, bridging the divide between the people and God as a high priest, giving us access directly to God. And we can have confidence that when we enter those most holy places, that we will not expire, we will not die, but we will find life and life abundantly. And so he tells us, with that confidence in hand, let us learn to draw near to God. We no longer need to fear that the presence of God will kill us. We should have the reverence in the, in the presence of God, but we don't have to fear that we might die. So let us now, because the veil has been torn and removed, let us draw near. Let us come near to God and find that God has always been near to us. Wanting us to call upon his name. Wanting us to, to come into his presence. It's unfathomable the freedoms that Jesus has given us in his life, death, and his resurrection. The power and the assurance of our faith. The author of Hebrews also tells us then and instructs us to not only draw near, but to also have an unswerving hope, an unmovable hope. That no matter what is going on in life, no matter what your brokenness is on that record, that LP, that place that you just seem to be stuck in, no matter what is going on in life, if, God, if we can draw near to God and God is in our presence, we can have the hope that even in the midst of these circumstances, God is with us. God is near us. Because God chose in Jesus Christ to draw near to us and remove the gap. So let us find hope. Let us find encouragement in that very profession. That every time we say God is faithful to his promises, we are exercising our hope that though today it is not perfect, though we see through a glass dimly, yet we will see in full. All because our profession is, is that God, though we do not see his promises completely fulfilled as of today, he will fulfill his promise. And what is that? But that Jesus is coming again. That Jesus is coming and he will come and he will take the dead in Christ, and he will raise them out of their graves. And when we see that happen, when we see that day coming, we will not fear, but we will rejoice because our time is coming as well. Those of us that are alive and professing Jesus today, we will be taken up just as they are taken up. And we will know that the day, the birth pangs, as Mark says, have begun. <laughs> Let us hold unswerving. Let us not be um, let us not be taken off our course of the hope that we serve a God who is faithful to his promises and will make them happen. And then he gives us some practical advice. <clears throat> let us learn. In the midst of all these truths, let us consider how we might encourage one another. 
Let us consider how we might build each other up. Let us consider how we might breathe good news into each other's lives. So that this hope will stir up in our hearts and it will lead us to good deeds. It will lead us deeper into the truth of God's love, which has freed us to serve him. Everything that Jesus has done is not only to free us, but to free us to serve and to be the people that carry the good message through our very lives into the world around us. A world whose LPs, whose records are just spinning. They're stuck in their brains. There's someone in your life around you. There's someone here today that may need your encouragement. How is it that we can encourage each other? By being each other's strength when it's needed. By being each other's bottom servants when it's needed. By being each other's aides when it's needed. Through a word of encouragement, through a kind word, or maybe even being in their presence and helping them out in big and small ways. Asking them, what is it that you need today? And how is it that I can walk with you and find that with you today? How, how can we answer that question? But so often we get diverted from encouraging one another. Encouraging one another in love and in good deeds. Sometimes we are divided by our differences. Sometimes we allow little things to get in our way. Sometimes we allow ourselves, our personalities, our moods to get in the way. Let us release those things. And it's interesting, in verse 25, he gives us one negative thing. We are to avoid not gathering together. There is power in the gathering of the people. And while we often use this verse to correct people, I think that the author of Hebrews is trying to remind them that so often in life, our human tendency, when we need people the most, is to withdraw. I'm not feeling well. I'm, I'm in pain. I'm suffering. Nobody will understand. And so we draw, we pull it into our own little world when really what we need are other brothers and sisters to encourage us and walk with us and to be our strength. It's the power of the gathering. It's the power of worship to corporately come together and to confess the things that are, that are common in our lives. So often in our prayer time, sometimes we get really timid about sharing a prayer concern in our life, but the best thing we can do sometimes is to just lay that on the table and say we are a people that give our concerns to each other and we're a people that lift them up to God because we are in this together. And so we, it's, it's, it's important for us to gather because there's an element of love, of encouragement, of strength, of hope that requires us to be face to face. Not just face to face with Christ our Savior, but face to face with each other. And so let us not put off that, re that, that, that responsibility. Let us not lay aside the importance of the day of our gatherings, but let us come together as often as we can so that we might be encouraged and lifted up in the presence of one another. That's the measure of our faith. That's the measure of the freedom that Christ has given to us. And so let us spur, at, let me spur you on, let me challenge you that in this Thanksgiving season, let us take up the mantle of encouragement and gathering with one another. Let us find strength in each other and lay aside all other things that we may live within the freedom that Christ has given us. Because he has torn the veil. And he has separated. And he has removed that which separates us from the presence of God. And every time we come in here, 
We are celebrating, we are mourning, we are weeping, we are laughing, we are singing, all because we have found a God that has drawn near to us and says, come and draw near to me. Let us sing the words as a prayer. I am thine, O Lord. I belong to you. Let me hear your voice. And then to say, Lord, as Christ was, as Jesus was, may I be willing to serve you by serving others in the world and handing them the good news that you have freed us to draw near. Heavenly Father, as we gather on this Thanksgiving day to celebrate, Lord, may you simply remind us to draw near because you have drawn near to us. And may our lives be changed and may they be changed. That not a single person in our community and in our lives would not hear and accept the invitation to draw near to you. And to enjoy the freedoms that we have received. Because you sent your son to draw near to us. And to give us life. And life abundant. Lord, today as we break bread together, come into our presence. Change us and mold us. And send us into the lives of those around us. That we might invite them to this table. And that they might partake of the goodness, the freedom that you give us. In your precious and holy name we pray. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen. As our hymn of response, let's turn to 552. Sing, I am thine, O Lord. If you are able, I encourage you to stand with us as we sing.